Uh, I'm not Push Pakalra. I'm filling in for her while she's having a good time in India for several days. Uh, and it's she left me with the distinct pleasure of being able to introduce this afternoon's speaker, whose name is Bruce Stevens. Uh, Bruce uh, has recently retired after 38 years at the College of Medicine. And uh, he is a professor of physiology and functional genomics. That was a name that came about when we realized we were doing all of this molecular genetics and we got all sorts of interesting answers in cells and in cell culture. But of course, none of that's important is what happens in the intact animal. And of course, the physiologists tend to work at that level and they're interested in the same uh, genes in many instances and so we thought it was appropriate for them to take on the name functional genomics and that was good until the present dean about two months ago decided to substitute gerontology for functional genomics i'm not sure of the relationship between those two topics but anyway, that's the way it is in academia today. So uh, I don't think that's why Bruce retired, but who knows? Maybe he'll, <laughs> maybe he'll tell us. Uh, Bruce, Bruce is a real expert on gastrointestinal physiology. And by now you probably have realized that you pretty much run on your GI tract. If your GI tract is doing well, you feel okay. And otherwise, of course, you don't. And so uh, he's an expert on this. Uh, he ran the medical school course in this area, taught it for many years, uh, and, is, and is an excellent uh, teacher. And so uh, he's going to talk about the GI tract. And in fact, one of the major receptors for COVID turns out to be a receptor for other things as well. And uh, he's done a lot of work in that area. So it's my pleasure at this moment to turn the podium over to Bruce. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Except Julianne is going to set me up with the slides. And you're right, Ken. Um, Physiology is now Department of Physiology and Aging, which I suppose is appropriate now. <laughs> Where's my, uh, okay. Yeah, we were, we want to start in the middle. We were starting in the middle here. We wanted to start at the beginning. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about um, the role of the gut and its uh, microbiome or microorganisms, mostly bacteria, and their role in whole body functioning. And I'll try to focus the functions to a couple things, primarily to hypertension or blood pressure, um, to uh, mood disorders, anxiety, and I'll focus mostly on depression. And also, uh, believe it or not, uh, COVID is a part of the story as well in all of this. And I'm going to defer to Julianne to say this is not moving forward. There we go. Maybe it was a little slow. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge some of my many collaborators that have helped produce some of these results um, now and in past years. Um, uh, because this is not a standalone issue, my lab requires a lot of expertise from the outside, and we have a nice collaboration with, with many people within the university and outside the university as well. So for those of you that want a quick in and out seminar, you got it in this slide, because this is my last slide. Okay, I'm showing you the target on the wall, where we're going with this whole thing. I'll tell you a little story that's going to weave in and out of some topics that span a period of about 30 years. And what we'll end up with in the very end is this particular concept of the gut-brain axis that actually controls whole body health. 
Uh, and I'll try to focus on primarily blood pressure control, um, mood disorders. And you'll notice here that there's a two-way arrow between the gut and the brain because there's a two-way communication between these two. And part of the gut is not just our own intestines, but involves microorganisms, which we call the microbiome. So the gut microbiome with the brain has an axis of physiological communication that controls the other uh, organism, other uh, organ. And you'll notice here there's an additional arrow. So there's really a triangulation in our body of the gut communicating with the brain and the gut brain axis controls our whole body health. So we'll return to this slide at the end and fill in the details. Hopefully you will, you will be following along and see how this picture um, emerges in your mind. And the topics that I'll be, follow, I'll be covering uh, in order to do this are, first of all, I'm going to present three topics. First of all, I'll present the idea of people being a, a, a term I'm trying to coin called meta-organisms, which are uh, individuals are actually physiologically entwined groups of human cells, your cells, people cells, with microorganism cells. And this forms a a conglomerate called a meta-organism. Um, we'll take a little bit of a sidestep and weave in the idea of how the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, plays a role in, in, in gut health. There's a, believe it or not, a quite an intimate relationship with this. And then I will also weave in some other non-COVID issues uh, in terms of the gut brain axis controlling blood pressure, depression, and some other aspects of health. And the premise of this entire thing is that our gut microbiome plays an intimate role in our overall health. Our gut bacteria play, in, play an intimate role in our overall health. And it does this in the, by the concept that I like to, at least in some of the articles that I've written, I'm trying to promote this concept that people are really meta-organisms. We are a conglomerate of about a hundred trillion cells of our own kind of human people cells, plus around an equal number, around a hundred trillion microbial cells. Now, the microbial cells, of course, are about maybe one percent the size of our people cells, so they're all compacted in, but we are a conglomerate of these types of cells, a mixture, and these cells interact in a crosstalk, bidirectional mechanism so that the physiological interactions uh, impact whole body inflammation, control our bone marrow and spleen and immunity systems, control digestion and absorption related to our dietary intake, control neural circuitries, including not only moods but also cognition, control kidney function, cardiovascular functions, and other functions. So let's get into the idea of where does this concept of meta-organisms fit into first before we expand this to the physiology. Uh, the, the idea of meta-organisms come from deep in our evolutionary past. And I'll kind of trace this from hunter-gatherer times through our modern day times. So way back when, when we were evolving, we were actually co-evolving with our environment and other living things around us. With pathogenic bacteria, kind of bad guy bacteria, good guy bacteria, predators, tribal resources, in other words, other human beings. So we have basically a lot of competition. How did we survive all of this from the hunter-gatherer time through evolutionary adaptations to reach the point in, in modern day times. Well, what happens was that through time, we have co-evolved with bacteria called commensal bacteria, good guy bacteria, which helps protect us. And we provide a safe harbor for these bacteria. So it's kind of a mutual relationship. And our bacteria in our bodies are inextricably linked, and that's why I kind of put this chain here, as one unit. And that unit is what I'm calling a meta-organism of different cell types, people cells and bacteria cells. And the reason why evolutionarily this has helped us 
evolved from prehistoric times to our current uh, state uh, in, in 2022 is that the coevolution of our bacteria with our own physiology have set up systems to avoid s problems in our environment that would get us into trouble, avoidance problems. Uh, uh, anxiety and alarm problems, things that would kind of keep us out of trouble so that we could go on and propagate and have our species evolve to the point we are today. And also our good guy bacteria with our own cells have helped wound healing, our uh, in inflammation, uh, helping us with um, infection fighting. And so the whole idea of evolution with bacteria has set up our bodies to be an, an inflammation-based system, which sounds like it may not be that useful, but it turns out it actually has some evolutionary advantage in three different ways. First of all, there's a mutualistic benefit from the bacteria in our gut to help our gut brain organ triangulation occur because all those physiological events interact with each other. Our avoidance of dangerous situations um, uh, has arisen in neurocircuitry. Uh, for example, you might think, well, what is the evolutionary advantage of having depression or an anxiety disorder? Well, it's, it has been kind of the, the edict of biology is use it or lose it. And we have kept this in our evolutionary uh, adaptation because depression has caused us to stay out of trouble. Um, the so-called flu-like symptoms, where you kind of get withdrawn, feel kind of icky, don't want to venture out. It, it keeps you from staying out of trouble, getting eaten by the saber-toothed tiger, walking off the cliff and falling um, uh, in, into your demise. Uh, in encountering other tribes that can bring disease into your tribe. So uh, our, our, our behavioral adaptations or neurocircuitry come from this bacteria-human interactions. But of course, there's no free lunch and there's some collateral damage and I'll be explaining a little bit of that because I'm sure some of this is on your minds. You may be experiencing the collateral damage, the health um, uh, the, some of the, the effects that, that are uh, not something that you would want um, because of the metaorganism relationship with other bacteria. And I'll be explaining a little bit of this pathophysiology as we go along. So before I get into the actual um, physiology and, and mechanism of how our gut brain axis works, I want to take a little bit of a side story. And this is, this takes us to early 2020. Remember that fun time in our lives when, <laughs> when life just kind of fell apart? Um, in early 2020, this paper appeared. In, uh, actually, the, the research was uh, published, uh, was submitted for, for publication in, in January. And I wrote these people. And, I, and, and the reason is this blew my socks off when I read this in early 2020. I thought, Holy cow, this is unbelievable. And I'll tell you why in a minute, why I in particular sat up so straight when I saw this paper. Because this group had been studying the binding of the COVID virus, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, to its receptor in human beings called the ACE2 receptor. And they determine the actual molecular binding of this early in 2022. And I thought, holy cow, this is unbelievable. And I'll tell you why I thought that. It's because if you look in the abstract, this says the structure of the full length human ACE2, which is the receptor for the COVID virus, in the presence of another protein, the neutral amino acid transporter, B0AT1, and throughout this, I'll be calling this BOAT1, just because I don't want to go through the nomenclature of where that came from. So it turns out that ACE2 with BOAT1 is playing a role in how, uh, how SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the coronavirus, um, binds to our bodies, and it, it is formed with a ACE2 BOAT1 complex. Those molecules this group determined that those molecules, those proteins actually aggregated together. And I thought, 
wow, this is unbelievable because this says the findings provide the insight into how the COVID coronavirus infects our bodies. And the reason I, re I sat up so straight is because I remembered a paper which was written in 2010. You see this? 2010. This is a chapter in a book. It's called The Regulation of Amino Acid Transport by ACE2. 2010. And I'm going to show you some important text in here. I'm going to amplify that back up. This is the same text. It says here, this is in this chapter, this book chapter in 2010. Our laboratory demonstrated that the human intestine expresses ACE, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, which hydrolyzes the nutrient proteins, and this causes the absorption by transporters. And then it says, however, ACE2 was discovered now, this was written in 2010. ACE2 was, dis was discovered in the intestine, of all places, as a binding receptor for SARS, which back, if you remember, in around 2010, there was the MERS and SARS and the other outbreaks. Well, at the time, it was called SARS-CoV-1. There was no such cars because nobody knew anything about, about COVID at that time. So it says here, that the intestinal ACE2 causes the binding of this SARS coronavirus because this boat transporter is in the membrane. Now, the reason why I sat up so straight when I read that science paper, and the reason why I remembered this particular paper in 2010, which predicted that the SARS coronavirus would bind to the ACE2 is because I wrote that paper. <laughs> uh, I had looked at uh, the literature and the, the transporters and had predicted in this prescient chapter uh, that, uh, that this would possibly occur. And in fact, that, that really woke me up when I saw the science paper because I thought, finally, I have some kind of relevance in the world. And I was about ready to retire, and uh, I was thinking about toying around with that in 2020, and I thought, there's no way I can retire now. It's time to have fun with science and, and uh, get on the bandwagon, And because uh, a lot of people were then starting to collaborate with me and we with them in terms of how the intestinal receptor was related to the uh, COVID virus. And then in the rest of the book, we went on to describe the um, amino acid transporter which Dr. Copeland knows a little bit about because uh, I had a student that did some work in his department back uh, about 25 years ago on this particular thing. So you're a player in, in the development of some of the vaccines. This is the structure of our, our transporter, the Bolt-1, these, these two green molecules that we, that we discovered. And they happen to bind to the ACE2 which is the receptor for COVID in this particular way. And it is, it is this structure that that science paper determined. And if to see where this fits into the big picture, if this is a cell in your body, this, this conglomerate of this lump of proteins is, is all over the surface of cells, such that the little green, our transporter, is embedded in the membrane, the surface of cells, and it holds together in a, in, in a structural way the ACE2 enzyme uh, all over cell surfaces. Okay, so it forms this, uh, it's called a, a dimer of dimers. It's a tetramer situation where there's four molecules bound together here. Um, and if I take this molecule and turn it on its side, and when we look at various locations, we use the technique called radiation inactivation with a 13 million electron volt electron linear accelerator uh, in conjunction with uh, Cambridge University and determine that the binding occurs in this region and we can measure, you know, it's around three and a half angstroms apart and also down in this region. And so we knew that the, um, that the COVID receptor was bound to our membrane bound boat transporter uh, in this way, in this part these particular locations. So we have it very specifically identified. We knew exactly um, what the structural organization was. Now I'm gonna take that protein and I'm gonna turn it 
I'm going to rotate it. See the little rotation thing? And if you look on the side here, um, if this is an amino acid, I think many of you know that amino acids are part of protein nutrients, and we absorb these. Well, how do we absorb these? That's, that's what my lab determined is the mechanism, and it turns out that they are absorbed across the cell through this little cleft, this pore that is in the transporter, uh, and then goes into our cells. So this is the mechanism of how uh, the um, nutrients uh, get into the cell. Now, if you notice here, the cell has the, the ACE protein has these little purple spots on the top. Those purple spots are the so-called receptor binding domain of the COVID virus. Okay, it binds right up in here. And we've done some studies to show how the binding interferes with the amino acid absorption. But for now, let's just recognize that this is the location where the COVID virus binds, in the intestine and in the lung, by the way. But our game is all about the intestine, and that's what the, the talk is I'm limiting today. It's just the, just the GI tract. So let's take a look of what's going on down in the, um, in the gut. Our GI tract is comprised of a number of different organs, and we're going to focus on the intestine, the large and the small intestine. Now, if we take a look at this and, and consider the intestine is basically a long 25-foot long hose, if we take that hose and cut it in half, and if we're looking down the center of the hose, got me? Okay, if you take the intestine up here, and you cut it in half and you look down that hose, that's what this middle picture is, okay? We're looking down the center of the intestine, cross section of the hose. And in there, here's a, here's a coronavirus in the middle here, and I'll, we'll get to that in a minute. In that, this is lined by cells. The lining of the hose is like if you had a green plastic hose, it would be the inner, inner lining of the green plastic, it would be the green plastic stuff of the hose. And that lining is made up of individual cells. So that's the final picture down here, okay? And so if we take a look at um, this now on a cellular level, if we are focus your attention on the magnified single cell from the intestine, from the guts in your abdomen, that's what this right panel shows. This is one cell of our intestine, like down below is inside the cell, inside the body, up above is the inside of the hose of the intestine, and here's one uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID virus. And the virus has these little projections called spikes. I think, I, I think everyone's familiar with the spike proteins on the COVID virus. And the spike proteins have a receptor binding domain, which binds to our, our, our pink green conglomerate on the surface of cells, okay? Now, this fact was exploited by Pfizer because what they did is they took our protein and they took ACE2 and they genetically engineered a cell type that would express the protein in ACE2 like this. And they did this because they could use it as a screening tool to go through all their candidate possible vaccines to see which one would be the most effective. And so if we look again, here's our green pink uh, conglomerate binding to ACE, uh, binding on the ACE2 receptor binding domain to the spike protein. The strategy of, co of, of uh, Pfizer and all the other vaccines is basically to make antibodies against this spike protein so that it doesn't bind right here. If you can block that, you got a good, anti you got a good vaccine. And so what, what Pfizer did was make a series of mRNAs that had uh, mutations in the mRNA that would either enhance or reduce effectiveness of, um, of uh, your body to make antigens against this region. And they finally found, using the screening technique of our protein with ACE2 receptor, they found a sequence of a messenger RNA that actually bound it very well. And through, through screening hundreds of these proteins, they found uh, uh, proteins that came from the expression of the mRNA. This is the one that ended up in your arm, the uh, BNT162B2. That's the Pfizer vaccine that ended up in your arm. So just to show you that the intestine played a role in developing 
a vaccine that actually has a, has a, um, a manifestation for keeping your, your lungs and the rest of your body healthy. And we'll get into how that happens in terms of a whole body physiology. So let's go back to the concept of how the intestinal microbiome plays a role in overall health. And I'm going to return to this figure again and again. Here's our intestine, the guts up here, cross section of the hose down here, and then a little piece of the sidewall showing us individual cells. Um, if any of you or your relatives um, got COVID, you may have experienced gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, about a third of COVID patients develop diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain and cramping, vomiting. About a third develop these symptoms, even though the main, the main problem with COVID is the lungs, coughing and fever. Uh, many people develop gastrointestinal symptoms. Why is that? Well, part of the reason comes from the fact that the infection occurs in the, in the gut. The gut is the single largest receptor for COVID uh, virus in the body, more than the lungs, more than the cardiovascular system. And, and we, what we did was uh, collaborated with UAB and looked at the bacteria that are formed in the blood from COVID patients. And it turns out that we can attribute the COVID symptoms to leaky, back, uh, leaky gut syndrome. In other words, the intestine becomes leaky and leaks out bacteria systemically, which causes a whole body inflammation affecting the lung. And just to show you, I won't dwell on this, but if we look over here on the right, these are various categories of bacteria and they form an ecosystem, okay? Bacteria are not standalone single bugs, but they form an ecosystem in our intestines. And just, if you just look at it in a quickie way, you can see healthy individuals have a different distribution than patients with COVID. So just looking at the purple bacteria here, uh, the healthy have 60% of these and about 22% of the green ones, whereas COVID patients, um, the, the, the purple bacteria have dropped down and now instead only comprise about 49% of their total ecosystem. And the, and the bluish green one um, population went up, suggesting that the blue green ones were bad guy bacteria responsible for inflammation. How do microbiologists and how do physiologists and gastrointestinal physiologists um, identify gut microbiome, gut bacteria. Well, we do this by identifying their genes. And just a kind of quickie primer on, um, on molecular genetics. I, I'd get Ken Burns up here to talk about molecular genetics, but then he'll take over the podium. So I'm going to do it for you, OK? Um, and so just basically, as you may know, um, all genes, whether they're bacteria or viruses or people or yeast, are made up of the same number of building blocks. And I'll just call them G, T, C, and A. And they come together with these molecules that form the, um, the library of information that is our genetics. And what we do is we take a machine from a fecal sample from patients, and we measure these nucleotides, A, T, C, and Gs. And we need a little bit of a poop sample, about size of a pencil eraser, tip of your finger or so, a little bit, and we can analyze billions of these genes. And what we do is we can, we can compare them. So we can identify genes between two different organisms. So let's say we have bacteria A and bacteria B. Our task is to say, what is bacteria A? And, and is it different from bacteria B? Now, if you, if you put your if you put your cataract surgery to good use here and squint or put on your new glasses uh, prescription, maybe you can squint and see if there's a difference between this gene sequence and this gene sequence. Well, frankly, I can't, and so I need a computer to sort these out. And if you happen to be sharp and on the ball and you had a good cataract surgeon, you'd see that it's this guanine was changed, and in this gene, it's an, an adenine, okay? So that was the difference. One single nucleotide difference. We need a computer to sort this out, because if we have, if we have a menu of data, so we have 
10,000 genes, and each gene has uh, 50,000 nucleotides, and we have um, uh, 10,000 bacterial species, and we have uh, 100,000 different enzymes in 60 patients. I mean, I, it, gives, it makes my head hurt even thinking about how to analyze that kind of um, a magnitude of numbers. So if we had a patient, say it was you, and you uh, gave, gave us a, a, a sample and we measured your bacterial genes based on that slide I had before, and we'd find out that they'd fit into this matrix, and we had another patient, and it had another matrix. Well, how, are you gonna, how in the world are you going to pair these two matrices if you have 100 patients? Well, you mash all the data up in the computer, and it looks like this. And uh, before you kind of go cross-eyed, what we've done is taken a computer program and uh, set it up so that it does what's called machine learning or artificial intelligence. It looks for patterns in this huge astronomical amount of data. And it will collapse that data into, here I put it into the hopper, put it into a funnel, uh, uh, turn on the computer and let it run for a couple of hours, and lo and behold, that huge mess comes out and, and it sorts out the data for a simple-minded guy like me. Uh, instead of 100 million data points, it reduces it down and says, your data says you have three populations. You have a population that has depression. You have a population that is showing high blood pressure, hypertension, and these are completely different and can be segregated from a population of the control patients that don't have any of these symptoms and they're healthy. So we've done this with artificial intelligence and um, can sort out and identify people whether or not they have these diseases. With I, I, can, I can take your poop sample and, and with 95% accuracy, I can predict whether you have depression or anxiety disorder or hypertension or some of the other disorders as well, based on this artificial intelligence. And just to kind of give you another idea here, if, if we had a, a, a population that was segregated out into these four groups and looked at the various bacteria, uh, don't worry about kind of the number, the letters here are kind of small, you can just see anybody, you go down to the bus stop and say, tell me if there's a difference between someone that's healthy and someone with depression based on their bacteria. And it's pretty easy here. A reference person will say, this pattern is different from the person with depression. Very readily uh, discriminatory here, just based on uh, how our computer can sort this out in what's known as a heat map, which gives you either high prevalence, the red ones, or ones that are missing in green. And if we do this enough times with enough patients, we can distinguish people based on their microbial ecosystems. And uh, this, for example, are four different populations. And, um, and uh, for example, we can tell that individuals with depression have these particular bacteria are identified with it. Somebody with the hypertension has these particular bacteria and the healthy patient will have these particular. By the way, those of you that, are, that read food labels might recognize if you're, if you're a yogurt fan, you might recognize on yogurt, the bifidobacterium is, is, a, is, a, is associated with some health foods and especially with, uh, with yogurt. And, and, and we find that in healthy patients that don't have hypertension or depression, they, their, their guts happen to, um, happen to harbor a high populations of these bifidobacterium plus some other ones in an integrative um, ecosystem within the gut. So now let's expand on this. That was, that was kind of molecular level. Let's go back to the, the organ level and, and talk about our, our gut and our abdomen. Take a cross section of the intestine, the hose. We're looking at a cross section and how that affects the layering around the hose, individual cells. This is a, a side cut of, of that previous picture where this is the layer of the cells, all these cells right here in the middle, are the uh, hose wall of the, of the intestine. And up above is the inside of the hose, okay, with our gut microbiome, our bacteria that are always there, uh, plus some nutrients, and I've put in tryptophan as one of the nutrient amino acids. And then there's, there's, this, there's those 
layer of, of cells that has little junctions between them to keep that layer tight and nice and sealed off from your blood. So what the strategy of the intestine is to get content from the inside of your gut lumen into your blood and onto the rest of your body. And one thing that happens is our transporter, our boat one, will take tryptophan, transport it across using these cells and into the blood. And then from there, the tryptophan goes on and does some other things in our body. I, I have one example, serotonin. Uh, by the way, the, the intestine is the single largest source of serotonin in your body. Your intestine makes 85% of the total serotonin in your entire body. And part of this comes from gut bacteria that metabolizes your food to make that tryptophan to make the serotonin. Some other things that happen in the gut are um, the, ser the tryptophan that is promoted by good guy gut bacteria produces a hormone called GLP, which then modulates blood glucose by insulin levels. And there's a lot of other examples of how the gut bacteria modify our diet and through other proteins like our, our transporter, the boat one, can move those dietary components into the blood and the gut bacteria stay in the intestine because the junctions between the cells are sealed off. But let's say we have our kind of Darth Vader of microbiome here, the SARS-CoV-2 COVID virus, and it binds to the ACE2, which it is wont to do, and will kind of gum up the works of our transporter. And we've done studies on this, and you know, I'm not showing you those data, I'm just kind of giving you the picture book version of this. And so what that means is the tryptophan is not absorbed as well, stops the production of GLP-1, stops the production of these antimicrobial uh, products. We have a kind of antimicrobial system in our intestine that keeps us healthy. And so bad guy bacteria run amok and overtake the good guy bacteria. And these bad guy bacteria lead to inflammation, colitis, can lead to some other whole body events that we'll talk about in a minute, such as hypertension, depression, and intestinal COVID symptoms. And, and by the way, if any of you had, had have type 2 diabetes and or you have a uh, you had COVID and you had gastrointestinal dysfunction, your doc might have prescribed um, something to kind of increase your insulin levels, like Trulicity, Ozempic. Uh, the, these are molecules, these are these are lookalike molecules that take the place of the GLP-1 that had been turned off because of inflammation and bad guy bacterial overgrowth in your intestine. Well, one of the problems of the um, overgrowth, or what's called dysbiosis, is that the junctions between the cells become like wet tissue paper, leaky, and those leaky junctions then allow bad guy bacteria to get into our blood. So this is so-called leaky gut syndrome that you may have heard of. It occurs in some other conditions, like in Crohn's, people have that, or if they have um, wheat allergies to gluten, it produces an inflammation in the gut wall. It can cause leaky gut. It's the same, a similar phenomenon. I'm just showing you the example under the context of, of the SARS virus. So let's take that situation. I'm just moving that slide off to the left. What, what does that uh, how does that affect us whole body-wise? Well, if we have these bad guy inflammatory bacteria now in our blood, that leads to whole body inflammation. And this, of course, will give us the manifestation of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, in the gut. Uh, and it will cause inflammation in the lungs, can even cause neurological inflammations like long COVID, one of the manifestations is kind of foggy brain fog and some other problems with, with the central nervous system because it affects the brain. Um, cardiovascular system is affected and it's all because the intestine has, is shot because of bad guy bacteria that had been disrupted from the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Um, as you may have heard in the news, uh, one way to monitor kind of community uh, uh, COVID is to look at um, sewage systems. And the reason uh, that is, uh, like our health department monitors COVID rise and fall, uh, not based on 
you know, kind of health department tests, but instead by monitoring the virus in the, in the sewage effluence, where does that come from? It comes from intestinal COVID, which shows up in the stool and then goes into the sewage system. Let's now talk about specifically um, the, the role of COVID in affecting blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, sorry, gut microbiome and blood pressure. How does the gut bacteria affect your your blood pressure. Well, remember from the previous slide, we had the leaky gut, our tissue paper, thin, wet tissue paper gut caused by ba bad guy bacteria, and the bad guy bacteria get into our blood. Then what happens is it sets up an inflammation. And we've measured this. We measured bacteria from, let's say, healthy patients. It's greater in COVID uh, and under a number of different indices. And if we look at leakiness of the gut, with some indicator molecules, it's directly proportional to um, increase in blood pressure. So that the leakier your gut is, the more your blood pressure will go up. And this leaky gut comes from these bacterial cell wall components that causes inflammation. Okay, so gut bacteria are responsible partly for increase in blood pressure. And we've, we, we can show this and predict what the blood pressure is de depending upon just how leaky your gut is, depending upon how bad your bacterial overgrowth is. So coming back around and kind of winding down now, um, at the outset we talked about how we are really a conglomerate mishmash of microorganisms and people cells called a meta-organism. This has evolved over time during our coevolutionary period from our hunter-gatherer time through modern era. And we've kept this gut bacteria relationship because it's been good for us in some circumstances, although there's no free lunch and there are some collateral damage organ pathophysiologies that can arise. And one of those is blood pressure. And another one is another problem is, is hypertension if the bacteria ecosystem is thrown off. And so now I'm going to show you that first slide that I had at the very beginning. So we've come back around. So um, so I will have Ted and Ken, you can wake up now because I've, I'm done with this. I'm done with this. And we're going to go, we're going to jump to the conclusion here and, um, and, and fill in what we've been talking about. And hopefully you'll come away with a picture of how the, the gut brain axis involves gut bacteria, the gut microbiome, and can affect our overall health, and specifically blood pressure and depression. So here's our two organs, our gut on the left and our brain on the right. They seem to be disconnected, right? But in fact, the gut is really more than just our own tissues. It's got about three pounds of bacteria in there, which is actually another organ. Uh, that we're dealing with. It's about the same weight as our brain, about three pounds. So we have, we're dealing with the gut microbiome brain axis. Now our brain is responsible for many functions, right? I think everyone knows the brain is involved with mood events, behavioral events, cognition, but maybe something that you're not caught up on in this, the brain is actually involved in regulating blood pressure. There are regions of the brain, especially your hindbrain area, that, that regulates blood pressure. So anything that affects the brain in those regions can affect mood, behavioral activity, and maybe even blood pressure, depending upon whether those circuits are affected. The gut has its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. The gut has a standalone nervous system that's actually kind of smart. It can actually do some things. You can take a gut out and stick it in a big bucket, and it'll actually kind of regulate itself. The gut has its own nervous system that communicates with the brain. And it does this through a number of different nerves. Some of you may have heard of the vagus, okay, 10th cranial nerve, sympathetic nervous system. There's some other nerves, splanchnic nerve. So the nerves and the, the nervous system connects the gut and the brain, in fact, the gut microbiome in the brain. 
But the gut microbiome isn't just a bunch of bacteria in a petri dish. There's an ecosystem, a dynamic relationship of all those bacteria amongst themselves, of good guy bacteria and bad guy bacteria and chemical warfare. Those bacteria interact with our intestinal cell physiology. The intestine has an immune system which communicates with our whole body immune system. And so our intestine with gut bacteria modulates our immune system. And a moment ago, we talked about how the, the gut can have a leaky situation where it spills out undesirable content into the blood. And, and another phenomenon, those of you with a, a medical background may know that of the renin angiotensin system, which controls blood pressure throughout your body. And it has been recently discovered that the intestine has all the components of the renin angiotensin system in the gut, including... ACE2. Okay, so for some of you that are taking ACE inhibitors, or some of you that are taking ARB angiotensin receptor binding for high blood pressure, certainly someone is taking an ACE inhibitor or a captopril or COSAR, you may be taking an, a, a receptor binding uh, inhibitor. Those actually have an effect in the intestine as well and modulate salt and water absorption in addition to systemic effects on cardiovascular circulation. So the gut microbiome produces small molecules, which exchanges with our brain and our whole body physiology. <clears throat> I gave you one example here, serotonin. There's many other ones, dopamine, GABA, mood kind of affecting type molecules that come from our gut microbiome. Uh, various fatty acids like butyric acid, propionic acid that come from our diets. Um, some uh, food components make uh, artery hardening components like TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, come from bacteria. The reason why red meat causes cardiovascular problems is because red meat has a molecule called carnitine. Carnitine is modified by gut bacteria to form TMAO, which hardens your arteries. So it's your gut bacteria that take the red meat component and hardens your arteries. There's a connection in that way. And not only is, is, is there a two-way street here, the, from the top down, the brain can modulate gut ecosystems as well through the nervous system and through biochemical means. The leaky gut phenomena can also cause a leak in the blood-brain barrier, which just causes this inflammation, which disrupts blood pressure regulation, disrupts mood, anxiety, depression centers in the brain. And this all comes from the disruption of gut ecosystem bacteria. And then ultimately what we're interested in is our whole body affected by the gut-brain axis. As I mentioned at the kind of second slide, I showed that there's this triangulation. The gut brain has its thing, but there's also a triangulation with the lungs, blood vessels, bone marrow and spleen affecting our immune system. Even our kidneys can be affected by the gut brain axis and their, their control. So what I tried to do today is give you, kind of weave a little story about how we are really meta-organisms of physiologically entwined cells. About half our cells are your cells, people cells, half are microorganism cells, kind of took a side story here and talked about how COVID plays a role in manifestation of um, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus and how that can affect whole body health because of the gut. And then gave you a little bit of a insight to how the gut brain axis can affect our overall health. And specifically, I talked about depression and hypertension. I want to leave you with some philosophical thoughts here now. Now, that was a kind of a lot of science mumbo jumbo, maybe, for some people. So I'm going to leave you with some philosophical thoughts that you can take away from you. If people are really meta-organisms, that is, inseparable conglomerates of about 100 trillion cells each, human cells and bacterial cells, then what does it mean that if you eliminated all those bacteria, in other words, you kind of did an end run around evolution, if you got rid of those compulsory, compulsory bacteria, 
would you cease to exist as a human entity without those? And even digging deeper, what does it mean to be a human being anyway? If those bugs are part of a co-evolution, some, some theorists think that the bacteria have driven human evolution in the same way that like dogs have driven human evolution to, to kind of accommodate them. So that bacteria are really farming the human species as vessels for their propagation. So the final thought I want to leave you with is, who are you anyway? What are you anyway, if you're a meta-organism? Because of the inextricable conglomeration of bacterial cells and microbial cells. So I'll leave it you with those thoughts and entertain any questions. I have a, a mail-in question here already. Um, I'll, I'll maybe get to that right off the bat, and then we can uh, entertain some, field some questions. Do you want to uh, look at the chat and see if there are any Zoom questions that come in? So the question here is from, um, from, from Anonymous, um, is that, uh, unless Ken, you had something you wanted to, no, no, the... Yo, I see you have the microphone, okay. So, um, so the question is coming in here, it says here, could you explain, um, be, uh, besides COVID and certain foods, what else can cause diarrhea in older people. Now, no one else has that on their mind, do they? <laughs> it's the, if your gut's not happy, you're not happy, okay? So diarrhea is a prominent uh, malady for many individuals, and it can come from disruption of many sources. Um, I think it's a little bit premature to answer that question with a kind of yes, no answer, but I hope you have gained some insight to if you if you disrupt your gut bacteria, then some of those bad guy bacteria can cause diarrhea. Some of the diarrhea can come from other physiological problems. For example, they're talking about eating Mexican food. Uh, in the Oklahoma, Mexican food. Well, that may come from the uh, Montezuma's revenge because those E. coli may disrupt your. Those are bad guy bacteria that cause, that release toxins, that cause uh, um, uh, the uh, motility in the gut and water to be drawn out of your blood. So gut bacteria disruption can cause diarrhea, but there are many other non-gut related issues. For example, um, Crohn's, uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, you could have um, many um, gastrointestinal problems that are, that are outside of gut bacteria. So, um, Gut bacteria is one issue. Your diet can play a role because your diet can govern what gut bacteria you have. But all of those involve inflammation. So now you're not sure, it seems to me, about it, the bacterial component in there. Exactly. If you have inflammation coming from a number of sources, you'll have to do a differential diagnosis and see a gastroenterologist to find out exactly what the source is one of them could be disruption of gut bacteria. Hi, I'm Gail Robinson, and my question is, <clears throat> as we seek to uh, improve our health and understanding that leaky gut inflammation uh, caused by bad bacteria in the gut and having bad bacteria in the gut, maybe more than the good bacteria, um, by the way, we've hit upon a key point that it's not just either or binary. It's, it's a disruption of the ecosystem. Uh, all of those are, are not good things for us. What can we do uh, practically every day or weekly or whatever to um, counteract the inflammation, having the growth of bad bacteria and preventing or curing leaky gut? What can we do? Mm -hmm. A lot of it has, to, it's, it's just actually kind of a simple answer. Your diet plays a huge role because if you saw from one of the pictures I had, the, the gut bacteria compete for nutrients. And in fact, good guy bacteria take some of your nutrients and convert that into useful things for you. Um, Julianne, I, I have a slide that I could show to... to, to uh, and can you be specific on that regarding our diet? <laughs> Okay, um, we have found that 
Some individuals with hypertension, for example, may have the same bacteria that a healthy individual that is normal tensive without blood pressure. And you might think, well, well, what's with that? But if you look at the physiology of those bacteria, and I, I became kind of a bacteriologist in all of this, you kind of studied it. It turns out that those bacteria steer whether you have good effects or bad effects depends on what you feed them. So this unhealthy person and the healthy person both having the same strain of bacteria will have either a good or a bad outcome depending upon what you feed that bacterium. So if you give it a Mediterranean diet, that tends to promote the non-inflammatory good guy effects of a neutral bacterium. But if you have a, what I call McDonald's diet, then that tends to promote the, the uh, bad metabolism of the neutral bacteria, and you'll suffer the consequence of that bad metabolism from those gut bacteria. Now, the other thing you can do is um, you can uh, exercise is, is useful because it increases blood flow and it reduces um, stress hormones, which can modify um, access of blood to the gut wall, which the blood flow to the gut wall can modify which species of bacteria you have. That's how your brain from the top down can actually modify your whole body through the bacteria. It can control um, the kind of bacteria you have based on blood flow. So diet and exercise, and especially Mediterranean type diet that feeds those bacteria, whether they're good guy and promote them or neutral bacteria and turning on their kind of beneficial metabolic pathways, it is, is, it goes a long way uh, to, to doing that. Now, I want to go to the very end here. How do we, how do we skip ahead? Maybe we can, I have a couple slides that may be interesting to you. And that is, I put in these kind of ringer slides at the end. Um, there, uh, you may be aware of kind of the folklore saying yogurt and dairy products are antihypertensive. Why is that? I mean, it's not, it's not because the health food store wants to sell it to you. Well, it may be because of that, but there are a number of, of, of um, products. Here's in the middle here, but we're looking at antihypertensive effects of gut microbiome. I hope I'm answering your question on this. And the diet can skew the gut microbiome appropriately in their metabolic beneficial direction. So there's a number of products and basically that lower blood pressure, basically they're fermented milk products. Sour milk, fermented milk, yogurt, even whey protein, isolated protein. And the way they work is they produce these peptide fragments. I'm not going to go through all of these things. Actually, Bob Cade was kind of into this, believe it or not, into peptide fragments for, um, he was into it from an allergy point of view, and I'm kind of interested from an anti-hypertensive point of view. But milk proteins um, can actually lower blood pressure. How did they do that? Gut bacteria take milk proteins, specifically milk proteins, but also some uh, uh, ovalbulin from egg proteins as well, but mostly egg, and, they, and the proteins are called caseins or casomorphins. And these are inhibited inhibitors of the uh, a, of, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. So if you're taking an ACE inhibitor for high blood pressure, dairy products, can produce natural ACE inhibitors, which will lower blood pressure from the intestinal point of view because the gut bacteria convert those proteins from milk into ACE inhibitors. We've done a very interesting study showing that the certain species of bacteria, and I'm not gonna go into the species here, are antimicrobial, uh, uh, have antimicrobial, antihypertensive effects. I hope I'm addressing your question in terms of diet and what you can do. These bacteria, if you have certain bacteria, will make these particular molecules. And they are, if, if they form a, 
hypertension, hypertension situation, you can block it by captopril. I know anybody on captopril as an ACE inhibitor or any of the other ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors up block intestinal enzymes that are involved with blood pressure. But what we found, it's fascinating, and I'm working with Carl Papine, a cardiologist on this concept, that actually the, that captopril that you take orally is actually has an antibiotic effect and is an antibiotic against bad guy bacteria that are responsible for blood pressure. And in fact, the structure of captopril here, if you look at it, it's very similar to the structure of a nutrient that comes from proteins, this aspartic lucille dipeptide, which comes from certain food sources, are antibiotic and kill bacteria responsible for hypertension. Yes. If you have an unhealthy gut. Well, I can repeat the question too. If you, this is an interesting question. If you have an unhealthy gut, are you more likely to attract, or you say, would you be more predisposed to COVID? And nobody knows the answer to that right now. Um, and it, it could actually go either way, because if you have an unhealthy gut, and if your ACE2 boat one uh, tetramer is disrupted, it, it actually may not bind the COVID virus as well. There's a group, uh, Penninger, in Canada that is making an anti-COVID drug that is actually a decoy. It is the ACE2 portion without everything else to kind of throw it into the system and mop up uh, the, the virus. And, 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 and in the intestine, um, it, it kind of would be beneficial because, you know, it would, it would form a site in which the, the virus could bind onto. But, it, but, but if you don't have the, the virus um, uh, binding sites available because you had poor intestinal physiology, you actually may be protected from COVID. It, 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 nobody knows. Nobody's do I haven't gone into that level of detail. Yeah. Couple it's an interesting questions. question. We have a couple here in chat. Aren't most organisms meta-organisms? This is, this is true. Most higher level organisms are all our, our meta organisms, even, even um, uh, the elementary uh, organisms like um, um, so soil micro uh, bugs, for example, um, depend on gut bacteria to allow them their, their, health, their health state. And, and bacteria carry bacterial viruses, which change their properties. Th this, is, this is the new frontier. Our, this comes from a bacterial, this comes from a virus guy, okay? This, this is the new frontier, is to fight bacteria, bad guy bacteria, bacteriophages or bacterial viruses actually are now being investigated as a drug tool. So bacterial viruses may be on the horizon for controlling depression and blood pressure. Very interesting question. What about germ-free mice? If, uh, we've done some experiments with, um, um, we started to do experiments till the student kind of walked away from the project anyway, on, 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 on mice that, that had various intestinal uh, um, bacterial situations. If you take germ-free mice, take the, the pups from the germ-free mice, those, those neonatal mice will die after a couple of weeks. They won't thrive. You need those bacteria as part of your, that's why I put those questions, these philosophical questions. Without those, you will die without gut bacteria. And in fact, in the NICU, neonatal intensive care unit in, in the hospital, newborn baby, babies have to get their gut, their bacteria from somewhere. They get it from their mothers. And if you have a C-section mother, there's experiments going on right now taking vaginal smears and smearing those babies to make sure they get their mother's bacteria so that they're fine. And they're finding out that but, uh, kids that are on high levels of antibiotics or are born in aseptic or um, uh, basically kind of sterile situations um, have this failure to thrive syndrome. 
They don't live. You need the bacteria to thrive. There are germ-free mice. Back, there's a whole germ-free mice. Um, not for long. Not for long. Yeah. Okay, that's the answer. Yeah, the UF has a whole wing of germ-free mice growing with the boxes. And, um, but the problem is they don't last long. You have to knock the, the experiments are basically born germ free and then you, you you spike them with certain bacteria or metabolism or drugs um, and they won't last long with without the bacteria that you, you need that lots of actual experiments that demonstrate beautifully that cleanliness is not next to godliness <laughs> and it has a corollary to your question um, what can be done, and it's actually been in the literature quite a bit. As I say, we started this and kind of had to stop the project. If you take a, a mouse, take two mice, one group of mice that have hypertension, and you can genetically engineer them to have hypertension, and another group of healthy mice that don't have hypertension, okay? And if you take the poop sample out of the first mice and you give them an enema in the second healthy mice, the healthy mice will develop hypertension. And you can do a reverse experiment as well. And in fact, clinically, this is done with people with C, uh, C. diff, Clostridium, Clostridioides difficile. If you have a C. diff infection, you can take a poop sample, it's called a FMT, fecal matter transplants. So fecal transplants are FDA approved now. Uh, UF is setting up a clinic, uh, GI is setting, they set up a clinic on this and, and kind of shut it down with one of their faculty left the practice, but I think they're going to come back online. You can take healthy poop samples, put them into someone with a high level of infection or a certain disease state like C. diff infection or experimentally depression or, or, or hypertension, and correct that with a poop sample. All right, we have a question here. Are there any new discoveries about nutrition that help maintain a healthy gut? Uh, nutrition, um, new discoveries, you know, there's sort of nothing new under the sun when we talk about Mediterranean diet being a healthy diet. It's just that I think we're just rediscovering what really has worked all along. Yeah, except you don't know because if you look at people who are on the Stolman diet, which is the antithesis of what you would think would be a healthy diet, and you look at their chemistries, they actually have better chemistries and other things. Well, some of it has to do with the interplay of being an ecosystem. So if you skew, if that, if that's, if that, if that intervention skewed metabolism in one direction, maybe unexpectedly, um, that could be beneficial. It's you're kind of playing with fire when you're playing with an ecosystem. Just like now, we know that if you kind of raise the temperature two or three degrees. The whole ecosystem is shot. Well, it's sort of that situation, you know, worldwide, you know, worldwide, like earthwise. The same thing happens in, on a microscopic level in your gut, your whole body. Um, it's an ecosystem, and you throw one little thing off, and it can, it can, it can throw your whole health, health situation off. Dr. Stevens, do you have time for two more questions here? I'm, well, All right, Jordan I'm, Goodman, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I have well, actually two things. Uh, one may have been mentioned, but somebody came to my door just as the question started. But would taking uh, an ACE receptor blocker possibly help prevent uh, at least a bad case of, of, of COVID uh, by blocking that receptor? And the other question I had, I noticed in one of your slides you had uh, mTOR, and when it was inhibited, that seemed to contribute to the growth of the, more of the harmful uh, microbiome, and yet I uh, was wondering about uh, metformin, which I believe is an inhibitor of mTOR, and the effects that that would have, because metformin supposedly um, is a very a beneficial drug to take in terms of uh, longevity and uh, cardiovascular disease and that. Okay, two, two parts to that. The first part is uh, tune up your ears. There's uh, angiotensin converting enzyme is ACE. That's the one that's the primary renin angiotensin system that you modify with, with captopril or something. The receptor for the virus is the genetic homologue of that called ACE2. It's a completely different gene. Okay. It's, it's okay. on a different chromosome. It's a completely different situation. So 
Um, this actually was controversial back in 2020 as to whether whether if you're uh, taking antihypertensive drugs, would that be good for you or bad for you? And I advocated it would be good for you because the ACE2 is the branch of uh, blood pressure reg regulation that is the beneficial branch. ACE is the inf is the harmful branch of blood pressure. So that if you take ACE inhibitors, that actually is good for you for COVID, or angiotensin re ARBs, angiotensin um, binding um, compounds. ARBs and ACE2s, you should take them with COVID. They have nothing to do with ACE2, those block ACE, okay? So I hope that clears that up. Um, now, the second question about the mTOR, uh, I try to make this kind of simple-minded because mTOR is one of, of, of many, many um, um, signaling molecules. PAX6 is another. There's, there's you know, IL-17 related. And... and, and the, you may want to mute, mute here, yeah. And and uh, uh, mTOR is actually activated uh, as a growth promoting um, uh, signaling molecule by another a number of other amino acids like glutamine, which you know about, and uh, arginine and some other amino acids, which are sort of growth hormone promoting. So you're right; it 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 is a it's, it can be a beneficial. Um, uh, it can have multiple effects. mTOR is, is a complex story. Maybe I kind of got myself into trouble by putting that in as, as sort of one branch of its regulatory mechanisms. Um, uh, so the, the, the regulation, the intracellular signaling is extremely complex, and uh, I, I'm kind of not going to get into that in here. Okay, but, and thank you. Uh, real quick, Madeline. Mitchell, go ahead. I was wondering about, you mentioned carnitine. And I wondered when that research had come out. Oh, this has been known for at least a decade, the idea of carnitine. Um, trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, comes from gut bacteria, bad guy bacteria. And it comes from two sources in our diet. It comes from carnitine, and it comes from choline, or acetylcholine, which comes from egg yolks. Okay, so the reason why egg yolks uh, are harmful to vascular system is a little bit the cholesterol in them, although your liver can pretty much handle the cholesterol. So it's not as much the cholesterol in egg yolks, it's the fact that the choline in the egg yolks make uh, form a, a food source for bad guy bacteria to make TMAO, which causes hardening of the arteries. And carnitine, the, the word comes, you know, from the the Latin origin, carn, you know, from carn, it's a, it's an amino, it's a dipeptide that comes from meat, carnitine, get it? It's an amino acid grouping dipeptide that comes from meat, and it primarily comes from, from um, animal meat products. I, this has a, been a great lecture, which raises the question, which is more basic for medical education, microbiology, or physics? Probably it's a village, and I would uh, I would thank Bruce tremendously for this lecture. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Very attentive audience.